Well, good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley here. Thank you for tuning in to my channel. This is a discussion of this week's research updates. Uh, there were plenty of re research articles published this week, and you'll find them in the description that goes with this video. There's only three that I want to talk about that I thought were noteworthy, and uh, one of those begins with, I think, a bit of good news. This is an article that was published over in Psychotherapy Research, and it's a study that compared a form of cognitive behavioral therapy for ADHD known as dialectical behavior therapy, with treatment as usual for adults with ADHD. The authors of this study did a randomized trial in which they assigned half of their sample to get this form of cognitive behavioral therapy with skills training and compared it to a group of adults who got treatment as usual or may have gotten little treatment at all. Uh, and the study found that those who got the dialectical behavior therapy with skills training showed improvements not only in their ADHD symptoms, but also a decrease in emotional regulation problems, an increase in life satisfaction, and in life functioning. So overall, I thought a very positive study that fits with a much larger literature on the effectiveness of cognitive behavior therapy that targets executive functioning, among other skills, in helping adults with ADHD to cope with their disorder. Now, mind you, these results are not as good as what we get with medication, so no one views either CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, or this version of it, DBT, as equivalent to medication, because it's not. Indeed, many authors who have developed programs of CBT for adults with ADHD argue that the best results come from when the adults are on medication and then go through the treatment program. And that's probably the case here as well. So, But overall, some more good news about the role of cognitive therapies in helping adults with ADHD manage their symptoms and improve their lives. Next up is a paper that appeared in the Journal of Affective Disorders Reports. Uh, and this is on the rather sensational, if not uh, scintillating, topic of hypersexuality and ADHD. This was an online survey of several hundred, I think it's, oh, let's see down here, I believe it was about 300 and some adults. Uh, and on this survey, they were asking not only about ADHD symptoms, but also about uh, specifically depressive symptoms, symptoms of hypomania, which is a milder version of mania or manic symptoms, symptoms that might have suggested a pre-psychotic set of behaviors known as prodromes, uh, and then of course impulsivity as part of the ADHD symptom ratings. Uh, and then on top of that, of course, they were looking specifically uh, at ratings of hypersexuality. Uh, and what the study found in this online survey uh, is that individuals who were rated uh, as high in ADHD symptoms also reported a higher rate of hypersexual behavior. However, the authors report in the conclusions that the relationship between the two was in fact mediated by several other factors. One, the degree of depression. More depression increased greater risk for hypersexual behavior. Two, hypomanic symptoms. The more of that, the more hypersexual behavior there was. That's not surprising, by the way. We know that people with bipolar disorder, particularly during their manic episodes, show a hypersexuality as well. So no surprise there. And then they also found a little bit of relationship between these pre-psychotic symptoms and hypersexuality in those with ADHD. So it isn't a one-to-one -one ADHD leads to hypersexuality. It appears to be that ADHD with certain comorbidities will increase hypersexual behavior. By the way, the strongest predictor was the degree of impulsivity in those with ADHD. And that, of course, makes sense when it comes to risk-taking behavior and hypersexual behavior being related to each other. Uh, so overall, a, a very interesting paper. Obviously, we need to do a lot more research. These several hundred adults were not 
clinically diagnosed individuals. They weren't even seen in a clinic or a lab. They completed online surveys about their behavior, and the results were then analyzed by the investigators. So uh, think of it more as a suggestive pilot study uh, about this possibility. We know that earlier studies on ADHD following kids growing up into adulthood did find that they started having sexual relations somewhat earlier than others, that they were likely to have to change partners more often or to have more partners, less likely to use contraception, more likely to have a teen pregnancy or unwanted pregnancy, and more likely to have sexually transmitted diseases. But there was no mention in there of hypersexual activity. So this is sort of new in terms of the findings on uh, risk-taking in, uh, that is, risk-taking sexual behavior in ADHD. So needs a lot more research on it before we can take it as a definitive relationship, but certainly suggestive of that possibility. Finally, there is an article that showed up on several different websites in the trade media uh, that was talking about, does ADHD offer some evolutionary advantage, particularly back in earlier periods of human evolution when we were hunter-gatherers. And of course, the articles were concluding that yes, it did. And here's a paper that suggested that uh, people with ADHD, at least in earlier times, may have had some kind of evolutionary advantage over more typical people at the time in our hunter-gatherer past. So I wanted to take a deeper look at this article because uh, th that's a very, uh, I think, uh, interesting finding to say the least, uh, because as you know, I have other videos in which I've argued that there's little of any evidence that clinical levels of ADHD are good for anything. We did find that a little bit of impulsivity was probably predictive of somewhat greater creativity and somewhat greater predisposition toward becoming an entrepreneur, uh, but that when it rise, rises to the level of full ADHD, lots of symptoms, very severe, very impairing, that those advantages were lost in the population. That's probably what's happening here, but let's take a look at the article first of all. This is also an online survey that involved more than 400 individuals, and they were asked to complete not only some questionnaires about their ADHD symptoms, but they also uh, took, took part in an online game of foraging. And the game involved being presented with bushes of berries and being given a certain amount of time to harvest the berries and then being given the option of moving to another berry patch when you thought you had uh, collected enough from that bush. And so it looked at not only the number of berries that were collected, but how often the individual hit the explore button, which would then create a pause, and then the individual be, would be presented with a brand new full bush of berries to harvest again. And uh, so it's a game. Uh, and the individuals who participated in this were not adults with ADHD at all. It's a general population sample, but they did sort them into those who had higher levels of ADHD symptoms compared to those who didn't. And the long and the short of it is the results found that those with higher ADHD symptoms uh, appeared to be more successful at foraging berries because they spent less time at each bush and as they depleted the resources, they moved on more quickly to new uh, areas to forage for more berries. So spent less time with each bush foraging and more time exploring new bushes. And what happened then overall is that those with higher ADHD symptoms collected more berries than those who didn't. Uh, so lots of problems with this study. First of all, it's a typical population sample. It's not clinical ADHD. It's only looking at somewhat elevated symptoms of the disorder, not looking at people with the disorder. It's using a game to sort of model foraging behavior as it might have been back in our hunter-gatherer past, but it is just a game. It doesn't have demonstrated ecological validity. Are people who are good at this game really good at foraging out there in the real world? We simply don't know. I can tell you that in my research on various forms of simulated 
activities like simulated driving or simulated uh, other behavior, uh, that there was very little relationship of what happened in the simulator to how people really acted out in the real world. So, you know, there's a big question mark here over just how much this represents true human foraging behavior. Uh, and then finally, there is the possibility that what you're seeing here is simply reward seeking, that as people with ADHD uh, become bored with a particular foraging bush, uh, that is, the reward value is going down. The more you harvest, the less there is to harvest. And it may be that at a certain point where of diminishing rewards, people with ADHD skip to the next bush more quickly than people who would have persisted at harvesting that earlier bush, even though it was being depleted. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. The authors interpret it as a good thing if you're a forager. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, what we're seeing here is a gross <laughs> overinterpretation by the media about a very simple survey study using a game. But that's our media out there. It loves to sensationalize and, and overgeneralize. So I think the relationship that we're going to see here between level of ADHD and maybe success at foraging, at least in the game, uh, is going to look something like the graphs that I've shown you earlier in some of my other lectures. So here's, let's think of it this way. Here's the iceberg of ADHD behavior in the population. I'm gonna use that as a metaphor, okay? So down here at the bottom of the iceberg, which is the biggest part of the iceberg, this is the range of normal variation in the population in ADHD behavior. There's a lot of ADHD behavior out there. Uh, just about everybody has a little bit of ADHD some of the time if we simply look at one, two, or three symptoms. Above that, somewhat smaller, is going to be the range of people who have more ADHD symptoms, but not a lot, and they're not impaired. Uh, and they're not diagnosable. They just have more than the typical individual. Let me go back here for a moment. And then at the top of the iceberg are people with lots of ADHD symptoms that are occurring often or more frequently in their life, are more severe, and are leading to impairments in daily life activities. And I think what we're going to find is that people within the normal range who may, second level here, have somewhat more symptoms of ADHD than others, but are not ADHD, they're just ADHD-like individuals, might be a little bit more successful at foraging than people in the general population. But that doesn't mean that when you start combining lots of ADHD symptoms, that more is better. Because when you start getting as many as six, seven, eight, nine, or more of these symptoms occurring frequently, occurring severely and leading to impairment, you've lost the evolutionary advantage that people with some symptoms might have had. We talked about this under creativity and under entrepreneurship. It looks sort of like a uh, inverted U-shaped function. Forget the labeling here on the axes. This comes from my discussion of creativity and ADHD. But what we find is that as you increase ADHD symptoms somewhat, in this case, impulsivity, right? but ADHD, you might see an increase in success at foraging. So some symptoms might be beneficial. But once you reach the top of the curve, once you start getting more and more and more symptoms of ADHD along the bottom axis of this graph, look at what happens to the curve. It starts to turn down. Now you're becoming less and less successful at foraging than are typical people or people with just a few ADHD symptoms. I believe this is what we see in the relationship of ADHD to creativity, of the relationship of ADHD to being an entrepreneur. A little bit is good, a lot is not. And I think that's probably going to be the case here with foraging behavior. But let me go back and make the point that I made earlier, uh, and that is that this study has a particular uh, set of limitations to it uh, that cause one to uh, not overgeneralize from it to human history, human evolution, and the advantages of ADHD, the disorder, in the population. Because as you know, I don't think that there is such an advantage, even if a few symptoms 
seems to be helpful for being a hunter gatherer forager. Okay, everybody, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this and found it informative. If you do, again, please subscribe to this channel or recommend us to others. Have a look at the description. You'll see all the research that was published this week, including the links to these three particular stories or studies. So thanks again for joining me. I look forward to seeing you next week with other commentaries and research reviews. Be well, everybody.